All right, we're going to start our uh, our open session prior to our closed session. Uh, so a call to order at 424. Um, this is the first time we've done this. So actually, uh, I'll turn it over to our, our new outside council who uh, let us know that we have to officially do our public comment uh, before we go into closed session. And then we can also um, call the meeting into closed session. So uh, first, actually, let me go to Charmaine, who has her hand up. And then I'll turn it over to Dwayne. Okay, because we have to do roll call. On my hand. Okay. Fair Hilbert. I am here. Commissioner Case. Here. Commissioner Fitch is excused. Commissioner Anderson. Here. Commissioner Dent is also excused. Commissioner Harrington. Commissioner Harrington. Here. Commissioner Smith. She was here, but I think she got booted off. She was going to try to call in. Commissioner Clark. Here. Commissioner Shea is excused. Commissioner Vaughn. Present. Commissioner Dabba Griffin. Present. Commissioner Spruce and Commissioner Pink, they are both excused. What do we have from Internal Affairs? Hi, we have Lieutenant Schmottlock and Lieutenant Sias on. Excellent. Roll call has been completed. All right, with that, uh, I will now kick it over to our outside legal counsel to kind of explain why we're doing this, and then we can eventually go into closed session. So, Dwayne, it's all yours. Oh, okay. Thank you, Chair. I think there was one other item on your agenda, Chair, that I had recommended, which is adoption of the resolution oh. authorizing and ratifying the continuance of teleconference public meetings pursuant to Government Code Section 54953. Um, that, that item is on the agenda, and a motion will be in order to adopt for you to continue to do teleconference meetings. Okay, actually... I was gonna see if anyone wants to pull it up so we can read it, but um, yes, you're right. <laughs> it's the curse of doing this for the first time. But um, yeah, the idea there as, as uh, Dwayne was just sharing is it's to authorize us to be able to continue to do virtual meetings during COVID. Um, so with that, I think we had a motion by Nancy. Can I get a second? I'll second. Second by Kevin. So with that, Charmaine, can you do a vote please? Case. Yes. Commissioner Yes. Commissioner Anderson. Yes. Excuse me. Sorry. Commissioner Vett. Commissioner Spruce, they're both excused. Commissioner Anderson. Yes. Commissioner Davis, Griffin. Yes. Commissioner Smith, is she aware? Is she join us? Uh, no, not yet. Yes. Can everyone mute themselves, please? Chair Halpert. Although yes. Motion passes. All right, and with that, uh, we can go to public comment, which I don't believe we have any. Um, but Charmaine, do we receive any through the web form? No, no public comment received. Okay, and I don't see anyone um, as an attendee. So with that, we'll close public comment and officially go into closed session. So um, if we scroll down just a tiny bit onto the page, we have kind of our legal rationale as to uh, going into closed session due to uh, government code section uh, 54957. So we're going to be discussing complaints, charges, investigations, and discipline uh, in our closed session, which is on our closed session agenda. And with that, I don't know if we have to read the whole thing. Do we have to read the whole uh, thing officially? Well, I'll read you in, Chair. Um, okay. and, and I just will explain to the commission 
that the Brown Act actually requires that you open your meeting uh, before your closed session. You open your meeting with a roll call, and if we were all in person, you would all convene, you'd open your meeting with roll call, you'll receive public comment, and then I would read you, or your general counsel in the future would read you in the closed session. The closed sessions are at the recommendation of your legal counsel to make sure that you're in there for the appropriate reason and there's a valid basis. And so in future meetings, I've recommended that the agenda be changed. And I'll explain a little bit more of that tonight when I do a little bit of opening uh, or do a little bit of, of, of training uh, with you on the Brown Act. But for now, uh, the way I would read you in the closed session is as follows. Uh, the legal counsel would recommend that you move to closed session pursuant to public to discuss public employee discipline, dismissal, and release pursuant to California Government Code Section 54957 to discuss complaints, charges, investigations, and discipline involving San Diego Police Department employees and information deemed confidential under Penal Code Sections 832.5 through 832.8 and Evidence Code Section 1040. That would be my recommendation. Uh, as long as you accept the recommendation, you can go into closed session. We accept the recommendation. Okay. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you. So, so now we can go into closed session. All right. So with that, um, since it's new for everybody, uh, we're going to log out of this one and go into our closed session uh, meeting link. All right, welcome everyone to uh, the continuation of our open session meeting for uh, May 24th, it's six o'clock. Um, it's a continuation of the uh, City of San Diego's Commission on Police Practices. Um, we started a, a new thing. So we actually uh, had an open session for our closed session or prior to our closed session so we could have public comment. Uh, and so now it's officially the report out from the closed session. Uh, during our closed session, the commission reviewed complaints against SUPD officers and discipline related to sustained findings. That information is deemed confidential under penal code section 832.5 to 832.8 and evidence code 1040. There's nothing to report out from our closed session. And with that, I will um, read out the purpose of the commission on police practices. The commission of the, or sorry, the purpose of the commission on police practices is to provide an independent investigation of officer involved shootings and in custody deaths and an unbiased evaluation of all complaints against San Diego Police Department and its personnel in a process that will be transparent and accountable to the community. The commission will also evaluate and review SCPD policies, practices, training, and protocols and represent the community in making recommendations for changes. The mission of the commission is to hold law enforcement accountable to the community and to increase community trust in law enforcement, resulting in inc increased safety for both the community and law enforcement. <clears throat> Excuse me. And with that, uh, we will move into approval of the last uh, meeting minutes uh, of April 26th. Do I have any revisions or corrections to the minutes? Not hearing any. Can I get a motion to approve? I guess I will make a motion to approve the minutes. Can I get a second? I'll second. Okay, thanks. Second by Doug. Uh, Charmaine, can you call a vote, please? Commissioner Case. Yes. Commissioner Vaughn. She puts a thumbs up. Commissioner Fitch. Yes. Commissioner Anderson is excused. Is Commissioner Dent here? Yes. Oh, okay. Commissioner Spruce is excused. Commissioner Harrington, excused. Commissioner Shane? Yes. Commissioner Dabba Griffin? Yes. Commissioner Smith? Excuse. Commissioner Clark? Yes. Chair Halpert? Yes. Motion passes 800. All right, and on to the special joint meeting of the Commission on Police Practices and the Citizens Advisory Board on 
complete on police community relations. Uh, this was the meeting about the countywide uh, MOU that we had on uh, April 21st. Are there any edits or revisions to those minutes? And if not, can I get a motion to approve? Motion to approve, Diana Dent. Thank you, Diana, and a second? I'll second. Nancy, thank you. Charmaine, can we go for a vote? Commissioner Case. Yes. Commissioner Vaughn. I abstain, I wasn't there. Commissioner Fitch. I abstain, I didn't attend. Commissioner Dent. Yes. Commissioner Harrington. Excuse. Commissioner Shank. Yes. Commissioner Dabba Griffin. Yes. Commissioner Smith is excused. Commissioner Clark. Yes. Chair Holpert. I'll vote yes. Um, I don't think we have enough votes. Six zero two. Who's our parliamentarian? Uh, so. Well, actually, Robert's rules does not require one to be present at a meeting to vote on the minutes, if that helps. Okay. I'll vote yes. Commissioner Fitch? I'll vote yes. I did not know that. <laughs> thank you, parliamentarian. Thank it's you for, yeah, I know, uh, Doug, thank you for teaching me something today. <laughs> so the vote is 800. Zero, zero. All right, thank you. And then uh, moving on to non-agenda public comments. Charmaine, I don't believe we received anything through our web form. No. Charmaine's shaking her head no. Um, and if there's anyone, let me double check the attendee list. Uh, if any of our attendees want to do public comment, go ahead and raise your hands and we can let you speak. I'm not seeing it, I'm gonna keep moving. If you guys change your mind, raise your hand and I'll call on you. Um, so the next thing we're gonna be doing is our educational topic uh, for today. We're going to turn it over to our new outside counsel, uh, Dwayne Bennett. He's going to be talking about uh, open and transparent meetings under the Brown Act. So with that, I'll introduce our new outside counsel, Dwayne Bennett. Over to you. Okay, thank you, Honorable Chair and members of the commission. Good evening. Uh, I will do my best to make this quick. I uh, don't want to hold up too much of your time. Uh, the Brown Act and issues related to the Brown Act are not the most exciting topics, but they're of, of so much and have such paramount importance for you. As a commission, given your role and responsibility to be open and transparent. The Brown Act specifies, and I will wait for my PowerPoint to come up and I'll just ad lib until it comes up. The Brown Act essentially specifies that meetings of public entities must be conducted in public. All right, that means that you as a commission on behalf of the city of San Diego must do your business in public but you are in a unique position because you also deal with sensitive information and confidential information that is prevented and protected from public disclosure under requirements such as POBAR under evidence code section 1040 and the penal code. So you walk a, a, a tightrope here and I'm gonna hope, hopefully help you understand that and navigate uh, through it. Today, you saw our meeting change, the meeting format change that was in my recommendation. Uh, and it was consistent with the Brown Act and what the Brown Act requires. And as we go through yes, this- Yes, ma'am. Excuse me. As we go through this presentation and as uh, we go through the presentation next week, hopefully this will become a lot more clear to you or those of you who are, are not as familiar with the Brown Act as you'd like to be. Well, the Brown Act requires that meetings of a legislative body be conducted in public. Now, the, a legislative body under the Brown Act includes any congregation of a majority of you. Any congregation of a majority of you. A legislative body also under the Brown Act includes a standing committee of less than a quorum. So for example, an executive committee, as long as it's a standing committee and has continuing jurisdiction and it continues to meet regularly, that standing committee's meetings must be conducted in public. To the contrary, if you have an ad hoc committee, one that is established just to do a limited job or is just established for a limited period of time, 
that ad hoc committee meeting does not need to be conducted in public. Now, you all have an ad hoc transition meeting. You have been conducting those meetings in public. It's perfectly fine to continue to do that. But the Brown Act does not require you to conduct that meeting in public. Your efforts to conduct it in public are just one other aspect of transparency, and there's nothing wrong with it. It's, a, it's actually a good practice. Next slide, please. Okay. Under the Brown Act, agenda drives your meetings. So you have to notice and agendize your meetings. Before you're going to meet in public, you have to give the public at least 72 hours notice. You may call a special meeting with 24 hours notice. And if there is an emergency, uh, that those types of meetings can be called in a one hour notice as long as there are other requirements. For example, the media is notified, et cetera, et cetera. There, the one hour emergency meetings are very rare. We probably saw a lot more of them during COVID. But the general rule is 72 hours notice before you can convene a meeting. And the general rule is that you can only discuss those items that are on your agenda. Now, you may be able to give brief direction to staff on something you want to see on a future agenda, but you can't, in that open meeting, you can't start talking about things that are off topic or that are not on the agenda. Next slide. Uh, again, only items placed on the agenda may be discussed. Uh, the Act, the Brown Act requires that whatever you're going to discuss be briefly described on the agenda. Again, there's some slight latitude. Sometimes there's an item on the agenda and uh, a commissioner wants to discuss something a little bit different, different or ask a question. There is some latitude, but you can't start talking about subject A and then all of a sudden digress and have a long discussion on subject D if it's not agendized, okay? Now, if there is a need to take action on an item that arose after the publication of the agenda, there is an exception. There's a narrow exception, but your attorney has to drive that exception. If there's a need to take action on an item that arose after the preparation of the agenda, and that item is not on the agenda, then by a four-fifths vote of the commission, that item can be added to that meeting at that time. That's an exception, but the Brown Act does allow that. So typically, the agenda is going to drive the meeting. Next slide. Every meeting of the Brown Act, uh, every meeting that you have must afford public comment. That's why today, uh, prior to closed session, you had a section on there for public comment. The public must be allowed to participate in the meetings. Even prior to you going into closed session, the public must have an opportunity to speak. And tonight, uh, you offered the public another opportunity to speak. That's, in, uh, uh, that's consistent with the Brown Act, allowing the public to participate in the public process, particularly as the e police commission or the Commission on Police Practices, that you have a duty to have these meetings public and also allow the public to participate as necessary. Next slide. Now, this is a very, very important point and I hope that everybody gets it. And this, this section of the Brown Act kind of trips people up sometimes. When does a meeting occur? A meeting occurs whenever a quorum meets to hear discuss or deliberate on an item under the subject matter jurisdiction. Anytime a majority of you meet to discuss the San Diego Police Department practices or complaint practices or an officer situation that you recall or what the, the, the police department needs to do, anytime a majority of you meet to hear that or to discuss it or deliberate on it, that's a meeting under the Brown Act. Here's the problem with it. If you're unwary, you can violate the Brown Act by meeting at Starbucks, a majority of you. If a majority of you, seven of you get together and you go to Starbucks and you start drinking coffee and talking about cases, that's a meeting. And that's a violation of the Brown Act because that meeting was not noticed and it was not agendized. So as a former city attorney, uh, I had a five a member city council. I never let three of them get together. <laughs> Anytime two of them got together, I'd get nervous. Make sure you don't have the third, because once you have a third, the third one in there and they start talking about something that's going on with the city, that's a meeting. 
And if it's not agendized, it's not in front of the public, it's an illegal meeting under the Brown Act. And there are rep repercussions and there are sanctions. So you have to be careful uh, about those. And by nature, email communications can constitute a meeting and a violation of the Brown Act. So if members of the commission get together in a chat room and you all start talking, and a majority of you get together in a chat room and start talking about the cases or what was on the agenda or what happened last week or what should, we should do this week. If a majority of you are in that email chat room, that is an illegal meeting. You have to avoid a majority of you getting together. Now, two of you go to coffee, no problem. Three of you go to coffee, no problem. It's just when you get to being a majority and you're all at the same coffee shop, that's a problem if you're talking about business relative to the police department. And you have to understand that police officers whose you know, careers are, are uh, being influenced by the decisions you make have a right to expect that you're gonna do and operate your business appropriately, that you're gonna do what's in front of the public when it's necessary and what's behind the public when it's also necessary. All right, so you have to be careful that you don't unwarily get into a meeting situation or where a majority of you are congregating to hear, discuss, or deliberate on an item under your subject matter's jurisdiction. Okay, next slide. There is a teleconference in exception due to COVID, the COVID pandemic. Earlier today, you voted on that exception. Well, under the Brown Act, there is an emergency exception that allows for meetings to take place through teleconferencing. This was not the case prior to COVID. All right? There were some limited exceptions for when a member of the commission or a public body could be outside of the jurisdiction and teleconference in. But now we have an exception under the Brown Act, and this exception is going to sunset, uh, right? I believe it's, it's set to sunset in 2024, uh, where meetings are going to have to start be, uh, going back in public in and in, in a meeting room. But for now, we have the teleconferencing exception, but it's only allowable to you if you pass a resolution declaring an emergency, which you did today, uh, ratifying your continuance of teleconferencing. Now, the resolution that you passed today authorizing and ratifying continuance of, of the ability to have these meetings in public must be ratified by law every 30 days. So every meeting that you have, there'll be another item uh, on your agenda to ratify the option to continue teleconferencing. In that, in, in that ratification procedure, you will have to confirm that the state of emergency relative to COVID and the pandemic continues and you find it necessary to continue to meet through teleconference, okay? So that'll be on your agenda uh, next time and it'll, it'll be there every 30 days by law and consistent with the Brown Act. Next slide. One other very, very weary uh, and, and worrisome effort or, or aspect for attorneys who represent public bodies is watching out for what we call seriatim or serial meetings. A serial meeting occurs when there is a series of communications by individual members of the commission of less than a quorum, but ultimately involve a majority of the body. So say, for example, in a seven member commission, Commissioner A contacts Commissioner B, who then contacts Commissioner C to discuss what Commissioner A and B discuss, and then Commissioner C contacts Commissioner D to discuss what was discussing. That is what we call an illegal seriatim or serial meeting. That's a violation of the Brown Act. So if there is some aspect of police, some uh, police matter that the commission is, discuss, is, is going to discuss or you think it's going to discuss or, or has discussed and Commissioner A contacts Commissioner B to complain about it uh, and Commissioner B contacts Commissioner C to, to complain about it and to talk about the same thing that the, form, the first two commissioners talked about. And then that commissioner contacts the fourth commissioner and you all start talking about the same thing. Even though you're not all together talking about the item, you violated the Brown Act by having a serial meeting. Okay, so that uh, again is an aspect of transparency. You can't be transparent. You can't have a meeting of integrity if this is the way you're meeting because the Brown Act says you have to conduct your business in public so the public can see what's going on and people have a right to participate. They don't have that right when you engage in what we call serial meetings. Next slide. The purpose of the serial meeting prohibition is to prevent public bodies from circumventing the requirement for open, transparent, and public deliberation of issues. 
So you can see how if you have serial meetings, you're depriving the public of the ability to participate. And you could be making secret uh, uh, decisions that have effect on police officers in a private setting and in a setting that does not really afford due process, a modicum of transparency consistent with the public process. And therefore the Brown Act prohibits it, okay? They prohibit these meetings. They're very, very uh, easy to get into if you're not weary and that's why we're having this session. Next slide. Any person including unwary staff can violate the law because, by becoming involved in a serial meeting. So. If, for example, I, uh, as, as CPP attorney, uh, outside attorney, became a will of deliberation around you all as commissioners, I could create a serial meeting scenario. So I call, I contact Commissioner A and, uh, you know, to talk about something. And then I contact Commissioner B to talk about the same thing I talked about Commissioner B, um, A with, and tell Commissioner B, well, you know, Commissioner A thinks this is a good idea. Then I contact Commissioner C and say, well, you know, I think Commissioner A and B thought it was a good idea. And then I contact Commissioner D and say, you know, all the three commissioners I thought about or I talked to thought it was a good idea. We should put that on the agenda. If we're a seven member body, I, the, the, the staff or the attorney have caused for a serial meeting. It's illegal. And there are, again, ramifications for meetings being conducted outside the public. Uh, these meetings can be challenged. Your decisions can be voided in a serial case or a serious case. There can be even be misdemeanor prosecution, which we'll talk about next week. But uh, you have to be careful about these serial meetings. Next slide. An example of an illegal serial meeting scenario uh, is, as you see on this slide, staff talks to Commissioner 1 about a police review matter. Commissioner 1 calls Commissioners 2 through 12, assuming that you have a 25-minute bore, a 25, or uh, uh, assume that constitutes a quorum, 12 commissioners. Uh, you know, once that call starts, uh, once those calls start and, and you start informing these commissioners, you've had or engaged in a serial meeting. Whatever action you take, could be challenged, could be voided, could be enjoined by a court, uh, and uh, also ultimately, in a, in a serious case, uh, it could cause for some prosecution. So you want to make sure that there is no serial meeting. Next slide. I always warn staff and commissioners and public bodies about the usage of email. Email can be a real trap for public bodies. Never, I, these, are just, this, these are just my warnings and, and things I train uh, public bodies on. Never send emails to members, copy to all, inviting a response back. So if, you know, whether it's a staff or whether it's commissioners, if you send an email, uh, commissioners should not be sending emails to all other commissioners or to a majority of commissioners, uh, inviting the, the commissioners to respond back. Because once the commissioners respond back and hit reply all, you have technically a meeting. It's okay to send out information to all commissioners. You're not inviting a response back. Okay, we're meeting. Uh, the meeting of the board will take place on XYZ. That's okay. As long as you don't say, uh, we're having a meeting on, on June the 15th, please hit, you know, reply all uh, as to whether or not you'll be there. I mean, technically speaking, that becomes a meeting because the majority of you are, are uh, dealing with emails. Avoid email to have ongoing conversations where other legislative members are copied. You have to watch that. You know, email, you got to be careful with email. Employees should not send emails to have an ongoing subject matter conversations with a majority of the entire body where you're engaging back and forth. What do you think about this case? I think this is good. I don't think it's good. And you're, you're engaging the whole commission with this email exchange. You got to watch that because you can easily slip into a trap in violation of the Brown Act. And I always tell people, avoid reply to all responses. You know, if you get an email from Charmaine that asks a question, don't reply to the whole commission. Just reply back to Charmaine, but not don't hit reply to all. As long as you don't hit reply to all, you, you, you'll be relatively safe, okay? Next slide. See? Next, next, next. Are we stuck? Okay, assuming, assuming that we are stuck for some reason, uh, the, 
thing I will tell you, okay, no, we're not stuck. For, avoid forwarding also in terms of email. Avoid forwarding email communications, discussing subject matter content to other members. You, you have to just watch email. And, and when, when I was uh, working with the city and within government, we were constantly telling the employees, watch email, watch email uh, with, with council members because they slip into this trap. Use email only to communicate public information also. Keep in mind that when you send email, if you're conversing back and forth, you are, are, are entitled or you are in possession of sensitive information and confidential information. Email is public by nature. By nature, email constitutes a public record. So if there is a sensitive police matter that is before you and you're emailing back and forth, et cetera, particularly when it comes across the city website, that's a public record. And so you could disclose somebody's personnel record by sending it through email, communicating through email. Uh, it, it, it's, it's very, very dangerous. So I always advise against that. You know? So you want to be wary about email. Again, never send email to a majority of members at any point in time seeking or trying to seek consensus or to get an idea as to where everybody stands. OK, that's a bad idea. Next slide and my final slide is just to tell you that next month, I think we're going to do part two of this, and we're going to discuss closed sessions and confidentiality. Uh, it's important to know, commissioners, that uh, I know without talking to police officers, but after representing you know, five police departments, that confidentiality in police records is of paramount importance. It's legal. It's the law. Number one, it's the law, Penal Code Section 832.5 through 832.8, Evidence Code Section 1040. In order to get police officer records in a civil matter, you have to go to court. Uh, typically, in state or federal court, you have to call, run what we call, file what we call pitches motions under the Evidence Code to get these records. They are confidential. So what you discuss in closed session is of paramount importance uh, police officers are not relegated to watered down constitutional rights. They're entitled to privacy in their personnel records and in these complaint histories. And so it's of paramount importance that that information be preserved. And so although we have an openness requirement of the Brown Act, we also have a closed and a confidential aspect that must be adhered to. And we're, we're going to talk about that uh, next month. OK, well, that completes my training. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, I'll open up to um, commissioner questions, but um, one of the things is, is when Charmaine or I send out emails to everyone, that's why you'll notice that everyone's BCC'd is to try to make sure that we don't accidentally do a reply to all uh, and start causing issues as Dwayne said with the Brown Act. So uh, with that, I'm gonna open it up to any commissioner questions. All right. Not seeing any, uh, we will move on to the next item, which is unfinished business. So uh, as we all know, <laughs> the new month is approaching. So we're gonna be trying to schedule out what our closed sessions are. Um, so I know we didn't have too many cases on our closed session for review. So we're gonna be checking out later in the meeting uh, to see where teams are with their case reviews. Uh, so we can kind of figure out when we uh, can start meeting, uh, setting up those meetings. One of the things is we want to make sure we're, we're being diligent with uh, using our volunteer time. <laughs> so if we don't want to call a meeting, uh, if there's only one or two cases, because uh, we want to make sure that the time we have is, is you know, appropriate for, for us and what we're doing. So uh, we'll be sending out a, a doodle poll uh, to everyone again, and then let us know what your availability is, and we can try to get that scheduled out. So we have any questions on that? Okay. Um, Case reviews, as I said, I know uh, several cases are kind of coming up. Several teams are working on cases. If you have cases that are ready for presentation, uh, please email Charmaine, uh, Detective Amato, and myself, and we can make sure we get that onto the agendas. Um, the other thing is uh, status of our case review and evaluation, evaluation of discipline. Uh, about a week or two ago, I did send all the teams emails, letting them know if they had discipline to review. Um, as you may have seen, uh, we, we did make a recommendation that the department's not always uh, super prompt in getting us those discipline recommendations. And um, the POA kind of ripped us on that and basically said, well, you guys are falling behind on reviewing them. So granted, that wasn't <laughs> the intent of it. We're basically saying that the department's not getting them to us. And their whole thing is, well, you guys are falling behind, so it doesn't matter. So I just want to kind of make a, a reminder for everyone that it's important important for us to make sure that we review those discipline cases uh, promptly as soon as we get them so we can be able to finish those and, and close those cases out for us. 
Uh, any questions from anyone on the commission on that? Okay. Um, next up, and this is kind of like small and hard to read, but uh, next up is feedback on remote case access. Um, I haven't heard of any updates or problems that anybody's having with that. I know we still have the issue with audio files. Unfortunately, that's just going to be the way it is, which is, is a disappointment. It makes it a little bit more difficult for us to go in and get those audio recordings. But um, I, I think it's just a limitation of the technology that we have currently. We have, uh, as I reported before, we have spoken with um, IA Pro, which is the same tool that the police department uses to be able to catalog uh, and store all of their um, documents. Um, we are, are in the process of working with the city's IT team. Uh, so there's a couple of things that the city has to, or has requirements that IA Pro needs to be able to, to do first. Uh, one of them is kind of the Okta compliance, which is kind of making sure that we all have access to the right servers. Um, and also the city would like to see if we can get them on a cloud-based um, server versus uh, a server that's actually housed. So the police department actually has their server housed uh, at the department or wherever they keep their, all their IT stuff. Uh, but the city doesn't want to do that anymore. They'd like to keep everything in the cloud. So uh, we've been working with IA Pro trying to negotiate some of that. They have uh, indicated that hopefully by summer or maybe late summer that they will have those features available and we should be able to move forward. So I've been working with the city's IT and IA Pro and I'll keep you guys updated on that as we go forward. Um, Nancy, you have your hand up, go ahead. Nancy's muted and I think trying to figure out how to unmute. <laughs> um, how about this? I will go a little bit further. And then if you figure, there, there you go. I think you're unmuted. Oh, not anymore. Okay, well, uh, I'll move forward. And if you still have a question, uh, you can raise it. Um, there, other, I got there we go. it. Go ahead. I finally got it. I just was going to log my distaste for the current uh, editor when we work through the city. I hate that thing. So it's not what I'm used to. It's totally inadequate in my mind. And that's it. That's all. I'll shut up. <laughs> OK, well, we'll keep that in mind to see if there's other options. Obviously, the city does have the Microsoft Office suite. So if there's something that we can do, it's a little bit different um, for any members of the public. We're using um, a secure Google Drive, so we're using Google docs and sheets and all that it's a little bit different but um well I'll, I'll keep that in mind so when we're moving forward we can see if that's something we can go back to maybe the the microsoft office setup because i think that's what most people are tend to be familiar with thank you um office hours with ia so one thing is is as we move forward you know eventually we won't have ia office hours anymore the idea is we'll go to our own commission offices um and we won't really ever have to go to ia but uh, for right now if you want to still go to ia um, especially on the weekend um, let them know so they can book out the time. I know Nancy tends to go most weekends. Yep. That is available for all of us, obviously, especially if you want to go listen to those audio recordings. Um, but just make sure that if for some reason your plans change and you have to cancel, please definitely make sure to let IA know so um, they can release their staff because typically the staff that's there for us on the weekends, they're there getting paid overtime. And if we don't show up, they're basically kind of twiddling their thumbs and getting paid to wait for us, which isn't an effective use of taxpayer dollars our time nor theirs. Um, they work, Brandon, when they're there, they work. They aren't twiddling their thumbs. Those guys work as hard as we do on the weekends. True, but I think typically a lot of them, if we weren't gonna be there, they probably wouldn't be showing up. <laughs> so, I mean, no, I agree with that, but yeah. I'm just saying, if you're there, they're gonna be there working. That's true, I shouldn't have said they're doing nothing. That, that's, <laughs> that's not true. Not true. Um, and the other thing is uh, we will be working on scheduling meetings with uh, all of the teams, uh, Charmaine and I, to kind of go over cases, concerns, anything that's kind of coming up. Um, so we'll be working with each of you guys individually to uh, get that set up to kind of just kind of get a pulse of how are things going. And Charmaine can probably touch base on that a little bit when we get to the executive director report. Um, that being said, any questions on the items we just touched base on? Okay. Uh, moving on to committee chair reports. Uh, first one, Nancy with consumer education. I know you had a couple of different topics that we were going to be looking at. Um, we have our, our new outside counsel. So he's going to be doing, uh, obviously this month he did uh, the first part of Brown Act and the next month he's going to be doing another one. After that, there is, uh, I think there's like four or five topics that we were thinking of, of bringing up, but Nancy, I'll, I'll let you discuss that a little bit if you'd like. And 
And of course you might be muted again. <laughs> I can quickly go over what's on here. So one of the things we're gonna talk about is restraining orders. Uh, we've seen some complaints in cases that revolve uh, restraining orders and temporary restraining orders. So we wanna get a little bit of education on that, how they work uh, and make sure everyone's fully aware. And also since it's an open public meeting, I think it's helpful for the community to be able to kind of hear that and understand that as well. There's also the idea of having a meeting about interactions between law enforcement and the Kumeyaay people. Uh, as well as a show of force, use of force, and reporting um, requirements. That was also something that initially kind of came up from a, of a complaint that we had, and we brought it to the policy committee um, about if, a, if an officer, for example, unholsters their weapon and they hold it down by their thigh, which is sometimes called like low ready, or if they even kind of pointed at someone's feet, for example, um, is that a reportable uh, show, of, or, uh, show of force or use of force? Um, there is an update I, I got from the department about that today, and I can share that with you guys uh, later once I've actually had a chance to read the training bulletin, and I can give you a little bit of clarity on that. But um, that was another thing that we're going to be doing training on. Nancy, is there anything else you want to touch base on on that? I'm going to guess not because I don't hear anything. Um, so uh, Patrick Anderson does our outreach. He's not here today. I don't believe he has any updates, obviously, with our um, ad hoc transition planning. Uh, meeting. We've kind of had constant updates from there. Um, we'll let Doug talk about that in a minute. Um, if there's anyone that has outreach events that you're aware of that you want to make sure that we are aware of, um, you know, please email Charmaine or myself and we can add that to our commission calendar just so everyone's aware of what's going on in the community. Uh, next up is rules with Doug. I don't think we have many rules things. There was one thing I think we had kind of tossed around, but I don't know if we're actually going to bring it to rules officially until we're an official implementation ordinance completed commission. Do you want to touch yeah. base on anything on, with that, Doug? Yeah, that, that, that's correct. So there's been no rules committee. There's nothing to report. OK. Um, also, with the uh, handbook, since we aren't the official implementation ordinance um, approved commission yet, uh, we haven't done anything with our, our handbook. Uh, policy committee, uh, we did have several items that uh, we talked about last uh, month. And then that actually resulted in several recommendations that we made to the police department. That memo was sent out, I believe it was the 5th of this month. And um, we should be getting, hopefully in the next you know, 30 days or so, we should be getting our official formal reply from the police department. Um, as always, for members of the public, we do put all of our recommendations up on our website, as well as the police department's responses on whether or not they will or will not implement our recommendations. That also goes up onto the website. Um, Next up, I don't know, Kevin's not here, but recruitment and training. Um, there's not a lot going on with that. I know we have been collecting some people who are interested on being on the, the full-time uh, implement, implementation, uh, the full-time commission once we are, are complete. Um, but that's kind of in a holding pattern for right now, but we are looking to see what we can do to try to shorten that window of getting new commissioners um, set up. And then once they are appointed to be able to get them to be trained. Uh, so that's also kind of on hold. Um, the Citizens Advisory Board on Police Community Relations, the last meeting got canceled. Uh, I think it was a quorum issue, I believe. Uh, so that didn't happen, but we did have our joint meeting that we, we talked about a little bit earlier where we approved the meeting minutes. The idea behind that was to try to get more information from both the police department and the sheriff's department about how this new uh, community-wide MOU will impact how our commission reviews officer-involved shootings. Um, unfortunately, as we talked about in the meeting, the sheriff's department was not able to attend, but we did get some representation from San Diego Police Department. And I think that was helpful when they were able to answer some of our questions. Um, but of course, I think we still had some more, but we'll probably keep uh, going on that. We are gonna try to see if we can uh, include the sheriff's department and have them come back in and, and talk with us at some point in the future. And last uh, is the ad hoc transition planning committee. Doug, I'll kick that over to you. Okay, uh, first there is the uh, budget update. Uh, since we had our last open meeting, uh, we had our hearing before the uh, the budget Review Committee, uh, which basically is the City Council serving as a committee of the whole. Uh, we presented our budget. Uh, they had no questions uh, and there were no modifications in the mayor's revise. And uh, the uh, City Council will be approving the budget, uh, I believe it's a June 13th or 14th. And uh, unless something unexpected happens, uh, the budget uh, as budget revisions, as we discussed at last month's meeting, uh, looks like they will be approved. Um, staffing uh, update, uh, we are in the process of doing uh, two searches. Uh, one of them is uh, about halfway along, I guess, and that is for our deputy executive director, who will be primarily responsible for uh, 
community engagement. Uh, we have are using an outside executive search firm. And remind me of the name of the firm, Charmaine. CPS HR. CPS. Um, and um, I think as of last week, there were almost uh, 60 applications. And uh, we will be meeting. Uh, and the deadline is uh, this week, I believe. And uh, so our consultant will be going through those and selecting uh, those that uh, we, we will be inviting to do uh, presentations. Um, and we've also uh, selected uh, about uh, 10 community groups uh, who will participate in a, a community panel to give us feedback uh, prior to the uh, prior to the final selection. So that that one is moving along, and we are just in the process of beginning the process for the uh, supervising investigator. Uh, we got approval from the city to use the CPS, is that correct? Uh, the same firm to uh, do the uh, supervising investigator. And uh, so we're just at the initial stages of approving the uh, job description and so forth for that, but those are, those are moving along. Um, the uh, draft implementation ordinance, uh, the Implementation ordinance, as we understand it, uh, is in meet and confer, and uh, we're hearing uh, from sources at City Council that the POA is giving a lot of pushback to the ordinance, and so it'll be interesting to see uh, what transpires there. Um, in addition, uh, the uh, City Council uh, today uh, approved uh, our request to modify our interim standard operating procedures so that we can uh, make uh, comments on officer involved shootings uh, that occur after the commission was chaptered, but before we have the opportunity to do our independent investigations, keeping in mind we have to have investigation procedures approved by the city council and have to hire investigators to do that. And so that, since the initial uh, interim operating procedures uh, went through a media confer, the amendment will also go through a through a meeting confer. And then uh, finally, an office space, and I am forgetting uh, what uh, happened since the last open meetings as we give uh, reports at our weekly transition planning committee meetings. Uh, but uh, the uh, it was determined that uh, the cost of renovating uh, the ninth floor of Civic Center Plaza was not feasible. And so we are looking at a new option. And remind me of the address, uh, Brandon or Charmaine, of the uh, it's um, 525 B Street, I believe. 525 B Street. That's what I was going to say, but uh, I didn't trust my memory. Um, and uh, so the uh, city has put out a proposal uh, to the uh, property owner, and we're waiting to hear back on that, uh, that proposal. Uh, and so the goal is to be able to actually have uh, office space to move into by the time we uh, get the staff hired to occupy it. And so we're looking forward to that happening, uh, hopefully this fall. And that primarily is it, unless there's any questions. Are there any questions for Doug? All right, not seeing, we're gonna keep moving on. Um, for the chair's report, I know you guys get tired of, of me always saying this, please make sure you get your volunteer hours in. Um, as an all volunteer commission, we do put a lot of hours in and I wanna make sure the city and the community understands uh, the amount of time and effort that, that we all put in to, to do the role of, of officer or police department oversight. I think it's an important thing for them to be able to see that you know, on average, we usually do about 5,000 hours uh, worth of volunteer service for the city. And I think it's an important thing uh, for, for all of us to be able to get recognized for the, the work we spend. Uh, you know, away from our family and homes and, and work. So please make sure you get those in. I um, want to give a quick update on the, uh, the regional and statewide oversight groups. Uh, last week, uh, the statewide organization met. Uh, unfortunately, I had a work conflict, so I wasn't able to attend. Um, but usually we get kind of a, a recap of email, a recap email that comes out usually a week or so later. I'll see uh, what that is probably sometime this week. Uh, and then the regional one, which is based out of, or is hosted by um, LAPD's oversight agency, uh, that's hosted uh, tomorrow. So I should be able to attend that and I can give a, a report back. And I believe both Doug and Charmaine, I think we're gonna try to attend uh, as well. Um, for the next steps on the uh, joint meeting we had, uh, based on some of the outstanding questions, uh, as I said a little bit earlier, I think our next steps are we're gonna try to invite the sheriff's office uh, to have a, a conversation and a meeting with us. 
Um, that I think is something that we're still uh, going to be trying to schedule that hasn't been done yet. Um, but that's really at this point our, our next next step items. Um, the other thing that, uh, that I recently did, and I'm going to be sending out my, my monthly chair update shortly, probably hopefully later to this night, um, we did uh, finally set up some CPP social media accounts. Now, the idea there is we want to try to make it as easy for the community to interact uh, and know what the commission is doing as possible. So we have Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram, I think that was it, um, that I, I set up. So uh, we do have a, a meeting set up with the city communications team. They're going to give us kind of their, their do's and don'ts, um, as well as kind of what the city rules are. Uh, we are independent, so we're going to be managing that ourselves, but we do need, obviously need to follow the city's rules uh, for social media. But I imagine that's going to be, we're going to be hosting, uh, using that to kind of promote and, and host our, our meetings and uh, send out our agendas and things like that. Uh, as Dwayne was mentioning, uh, because of Brown Act, it can't be a two-way communication. So people can't use social media as a way to contact us for complaints uh, or to debate policies. So um, we will be unfortunately limited on what we can say. If people do try to post stuff, we can't reply back, but we can uh, send them you know, to the link to file a complaint or things like that. But uh, once that, that's up and running, um, we will let you guys all know. And then if you guys have ideas uh, of things you want us to try to, to promote up there, um, share that with either Charmaine or myself and we can get those out there. Do we have the ability um, to limit who can post? Uh, right now, it's just me because I'm the one that set it up, but I think the idea is we'll probably have a few people. I don't want the whole commission being able to do that. I think that's a little, a little scary. <laughs> uh, so we might either probably have like Charmaine and myself, or maybe we'd open up to whoever our cabinet officials, um, but we haven't decided that yet. I'll probably bring it back to a future meeting and we can discuss that as a commission uh, and figure out who we want to be able to have authority to post on behalf of the commission. Okay, but, but it's not going to be something that the public can post to, is that um, I need to see if we can lock some of that down, but I think the idea is like with, with many of them, we probably like Twitter, I don't believe we can prevent people from posting, but we can't reply to them. But like on Facebook, for example, we can't turn off commenting, but, um, it kind of goes against our trying to allow the community members to, to interact with us. If we basically shut everything down, I think the best thing we can do is allow that to happen. Uh, and then we can redirect them to the proper sources where they can, you know, apply or um, file complaints or whatever. But I'll, uh, like I said, once we get a little bit more information from the city, we can uh, report back and I'll let you guys know what, what their policies are and their restrictions. Um, the last thing I have on here was I'm going to be doing, uh, usually it's like the, every month or so, there's a presentation to the officer academy. Uh, I'll be doing that on the 16th. Usually that's about a half hour to 45 minute presentation. Uh, usually what we do there is we just kind of explain who we are, why we're in existence, how it, it, it's important for them to know uh, what we do. Uh, and then usually it's a nice opportunity for them to be able to ask us questions uh, of like what we do, why we do it and, and things like that. So um, again, I'll be doing that on the 16th. And other than that, uh, I don't have anything else. Is there, are there any questions for me? There was a question, I think, in the chat. Oh, I didn't even see the QA part. Uh, the question is, do you have any information for support or engagement opportunities? Um, I'm thinking that means for the community to uh, work with us. Um, I guess, Maisha, I, I think what, if, if you have suggestions on things you need us or would like us to participate in, um, I'm more than happy to, to do that. I actually, it actually raises a good question. When we were doing our budget hearing uh, about two weeks ago. There was a member of the community that said, you know, hey, we'd really like for you guys to come out and, and meet with us and uh, have a conversation uh, with our community group. I did reach out to them and uh, we're in the process of trying to see if we can get something scheduled. But uh, that was the Oak Park community that actually specifically had asked for that. And I think we're good on that. So with that, um, we'll move on over to Charmaine and the executive director report. We are setting a world record tonight. We're going to be adjourning early <laughs> before seven. So um, the first item I have is item A, and that's um, the case reports spreadsheet, which everyone should have received earlier today. And so we started out with 103 total cases assigned to our teams. 33 of those cases are category two cases. And as you will see on your spreadsheet, they are moved below um, 
the category ones and the officer involved shootings as well as the in-custody death cases, right? And they're all highlighted in blue. At the March meeting of the commission, the commission agreed to suspend the audit of category two cases due to the backlog of cases. So um, as a result, the commission has 70 active cases assigned to the teams. One of the 70 cases was closed out at tonight's meeting. So the commission now has 69 active cases to review. Um, and in this fiscal year, the commission reviewed, deliberated on and closed out a total of 103 cases, which I actually, that's the same as the, the um, number of cases assigned. The breakdown is 94 category one cases, eight officer involved shooting cases, and one in custody death case. The commission audited 17 category two cases and evaluated 108 disciplines. The commission also evaluated two shoot and review board reports. So please check y'all folders. Um, I think the shoot and review board reports and Chair Hill could correct me if I'm, I'm wrong. Um, the shoot and review board reports are in the internal affairs folder. Correct, yes. So please check because to have two shoot and review, review board reports in this fiscal year is kind of low. Um, so just make sure. I know that earlier tonight, Chair Hilpert touched on the scheduling of the cabinet's meeting with the team leads. This is just a meeting to check up and make sure that everybody's doing okay, um, you know, just to get feedback on how we might be able to like do things better, any concerns or issues the teams might have. Um, I know our numbers are dwindling and we're down to like 13 commissioners, yes, 13 commissioners. So um, it's important that we at least try to meet up at least once a month. Alina, our executive assistant, she will be scheduling the meeting. So please look out for an email from her. And then I'm gonna move on to the statistics that's in the spreadsheet. Um, before I begin, it's important to note that we have no in custody death cases assigned for review. Um, we don't have any commissioners assigned to team two and team seven. So those teams are inactive. Team one has 13 active cases in their queue. 12 are category one cases, two of which have one or more sustained findings and one officer involved shooting case. The team also has 17 category two cases which are on hold. Team one, does that sound about correct? Commissioner Case? Oh. I didn't get a chance to review the spreadsheet but that sounds approximately correct. Okay, great, thank you. Team three has seven active cases in the queue. Of the seven cases, six are category one cases, two of which have sustained findings. The team has one officer involved shooting case and two category two cases on hold. Team three, does that sound about correct? That is correct. Excellent, thank you. Team four. Actually, no, and you answered for team one. <laughs> and I just caught that. So team one, which I already mentioned, Nancy, does that sound about correct, the numbers that I went over? Is she still here? Um, let me check. Actually, it looks like she's off again. Okay, I'll touch base with her after the meeting or tomorrow morning. Um, so team four has 17 active cases, and that's um, Commissioner Cases team um, in the queue, um, all of which are category one cases. Three of the category one cases have one or more sustained findings. The team has no officer involved shooting or in custody death cases to review. And the team also has 13 category two cases, which are on hold. Commissioner Case. I know the numbers are high. <laughs> Yeah, you're, you're on mute, Doug. <laughs> yes, that's correct. Uh, you keep giving us more cases, uh, but we actually have, have uh, decreased our number of cases. So we're making some progress. So it's no longer me, it's Alina. So, <laughs> <laughs> so let me move on. Team five. Team five has 12 active cases in the queue. Of the 12 cases, one was an officer involved shooting case, which was closed out earlier tonight. 
when that case was amended to make sure that the case report um, was thorough. So the team is now down to 11 active cases. Team five has plans to evaluate. So please team five to the internal affairs case folder in the Google Drive. Two of the category one cases have one or more sustained findings. The team also has five category two cases, which are on hold. Team five. What did you say? What, what did you say was in a folder, Google Drive? What did you, what did you say there? Um, disciplines from those cases that have sustained findings that were previously um, heard by the commission and closed out. So there should be disciplines for evaluation. We can help you find it. Okay. Okay. But yes, to answer your question, yes, 11, yes. Okay. And Maxine, okay. if you uh, look at the email that I sent about a week or so ago, week and a half ago, uh, there's a link in that email that goes to your the disciplines that the team can review. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yep. So um, team six has 21 active cases in their queue, of which um, all of which are category one cases. Three of the cases have sustained findings, and the team also has six category two cases, which are on hold. Chair Helper or team six? Sounds about right. Yeah, that sounds about right. We have three cases that will probably be done in the next couple of days. So we'll be okay. kicking those over. Sounds like we'll probably have cases for next week's meeting if we have a meeting next week. Yeah, I think so. Yes, yeah, so if the teams can let me know, um, hopefully by Thursday, I can set the agenda. That'll be great. And the next item is planning for um, our former CRB members and um, commissioners who resigned from the commission and the CRB. So we, are, we were planning on holding the appreciation acknowledgement ceremony for members who resigned prior to the passage of Measure B and those commissioners who resigned over the last two years. Um, so our admin aide, Robin Resendez, has been working on planning this event. And it's getting rather large. It's, it's turning into something. <laughs> it's turning into more than a meeting. Um, it seems sort of like our 30th anniversary when we were trying to um, plan that. Um, we were getting, we were looking at getting recommendations from the mayor's office and looking for the certificate wooden holders, um, certificate holders, something that we used in the past, as well as awards for those. Um, members and commissioners who served um, more than a certain amount of years and served in leadership capacities. So the next step is going to be to on a location. Um, so something that I wanted to bring to the commission's attention, it is taking some time, but um, I just wanted to make sure that everybody knows that Robin is working on that now that the budget sort of has, has um, dwindled down. <laughs> she has more time to do that. Um, Robin, do you have anything you wanted to add? No, I think you covered the um, majority of it. I'm just working with the vendors, um, trying to order all the materials needed. Um, but I am very excited to um, acknowledge and honor the um, commissioners. So that's it. So I, know, I know you and Alina, you're both working on the language to put on some of the um, the plaques or the awards commendation. So um, thank you so much for taking on this um, this task. <laughs> it is a lot. We had to narrow down the names and everything. So thank you so much. And Alina, thank you as well. Um, I'll just so jump in I, real, real quick on that. Sorry to interrupt, Charmaine. One of the things is, as I said a little bit earlier, is, is our commissioners put in a lot of volunteer hours. And it's really important, I think, for us to be able to, you know, when people have put in their, their eight years of service, sometimes more <laughs> in some cases. I think it's really important for us to be able to recognize their work. Um, and we didn't wanna do this over Zoom, to be honest. And I think initially we thought, well, the COVID thing's only gonna be a couple months. <laughs> and so we kept thinking, well, we can, we can wait. And unfortunately it's been a lot longer, but the idea here is we wanted to be able to have an in-person meeting where we can recognize uh, the commissioners who have either been termed out or, or have resigned for you know, personal or, or you know, work reasons. Um, so I think we're all really excited to do this, and I think it's a really important thing for us to be able to do to, to you know, give back and thank the volunteers that, that put all that time in for us. And sorry, sorry for the interruption. That's okay. <laughs> it's all good. Um, so the next item is the status of the inclusion of um, the interim ED, which is myself, in the city's department directors meetings. 
So I am pleased to report after um, a few years that under the leadership of the Office of Boards and Commissions Director Tyler Warren Robbie, that I, along with um, the city's other executive directors are once again included in the department directors meetings. So, and I know Chair Hilpert, he's been listening to me for so many years now. Um, so when I was first appointed um, to the ED position for the CRB um, seven years ago, seven, eight years ago, um, the EDs were included in these meetings. And then when the administration changed and the Office of Boards and Commissions was created, we were no longer included. So um, with that said, we also stopped receiving, receiving important updates from the city leadership. Um, I continue to request that we be included because so much valuable information on what is happening in the city, such as budget, um, you know, deadlines, and um, there's updates on PR water and construction and, you know, things that's happening in the community and parks and rec. So all of that information is so important and it's given by each department to the um, COO of the city. Um, so we get to learn a lot and we get to share that information and, you know, with the commission as well as um, with um, stakeholders. Um, so that's so important. Um, so I am happy that we are now included. The meeting is every Friday at, I think, nine o'clock, nine, yeah, nine o'clock. Um, so I am looking forward to sharing and educating others and the commission on the work um, that we are doing. So um, with that said, any questions or any of the items that I mentioned so far? I think no questions. So um, the next item is NACO, the annual conference this year is going to be in Fort Worth, um, Texas, and that's going to be September. Unfortunately, this year, I decided to not serve on the planning committee for the annual conference so I can focus my time on the transition of the commission. And I won't do that again because I'm missing all the updates from the conference. <laughs> so um, this year's conference is taking place from September 11th through the 15th in Fort Worth, Texas. And so far, Chair Hilpert and First Vice Chair Doug Case um, both plan to attend. I know Alina reached out to y'all yesterday. Or was it Robin? One or the other. Um, to try to get information as to um, reserving a hotel room. I see Doug, you have your hand up. Yeah, are they going to be doing a hybrid uh, conference this year with? Uh, I I honestly don't think so, but I can reach out to Cami. I don't think so because I haven't heard or seen anything um, about it. Okay. I mean, it was good to have the hybrid as well. So I'll reach out to Cami and let you know. Okay, thank you. Um, so um, for commissioners who may want to attend, please let me know. I mean, we do have money in the budget for training and it is an excellent training opportunity. So please let me know and we can um, arrange for um, your travel expenses. The last item is any, I guess, if we have any reminders and other items, I'll turn it over to Robin and Alina. So if you have any updates, anything that they wanted to um, say. I could go first. Yeah. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, sorry, if I go back and forth, I have it on my TV as well, just so you guys know. <laughs> um, okay. So, uh, Good transition. So uh, regarding the um, Nicole, I wanted to remind the commission that um, if you are available and would like to attend um, the Nicole webinar series, and I believe it's, I don't know if it's just on June 14th, um, Charmaine? I think yeah. so far, the first one. <laughs> okay. Um, if you are interested, please let me know and I can help, or Robin and I can both help you with, with the registration and getting that um, paid for. And um, so as our administrative aid is um, transitioning into her role, into the role for complaint coordinator. I've been working diligently on uh, receiving the complaints and, and sending them over to internal affairs as best as I can. Um, and also getting these complaints uploaded to SharePoint as well. Um, so I just want to say I commend Charmaine so much because you, she did this for so long by her, like on her own and that it's, it's tough. Uh, so I know that um, in in regards to numbers, I don't have exact numbers, but on average, we do receive about 15 to 25 complaints a week. Um, it could be more or less, it does fluctuate. 
Um, so out of those complaints, I would say that roughly like maybe a third of them are outside of jurisdiction. Um, so it's been a transition as well. So um, aside from that, both Robin and I are uh, trying to keep the case templates up to date to better assist with you know the teams. Um, as an ongoing project, both myself and Robin have been working with the IT web team to um, bring our commission website up to date as well. So uh, I would say most, if not all, the changes that we've requested have been completed and are reflected on the website. Um, in terms of in terms of meetings, upcoming meetings, I believe they may have. I think they were all already talked about, but I'll just say them anyways. Um, one meeting that I am scheduling uh, is the monthly standing um, CPP clerk collaboration meeting. And um, I believe I was able to schedule it and I, I haven't received everybody's accepting, uh, you know, haven't had the acceptance for the, the calendar yet, but it seems that it's going to be on June 22nd. Um, and then we're trying to figure out the, the monthly ones after that. Uh, the second meeting is the um, CPP team lead meeting with the, the, lead, the CPP leadership. So um, if you've received an email from me uh, and have not had a chance to respond yet, um, I'll just wait for you guys when time permits. If you can send me your availability, that would be great so I can get that scheduled. Um, and then the last meeting is the CPP leadership with the, is it the communications team? I was going to say everybody's name, but I, I kind of overheard Brandon, so I think it's just the communications team um, regarding the commission presence on social media platforms. And that's it for me for now. So I can pass it on to, to Robin if you have any more updates. Oh, thank you. Do, you, do we want to go, I see Andrea's hand, or do you want me to just oh. continue? Hold on one second, Robin. Um, Commissioner David Griffin, do you have a question or comment? Yes, I have a question, please. Alina, uh, so if we don't have a calendar invite from you in our mailbox, that means that that's, a, that's fine. Or is it for the, the team lead meeting or is it for the? For any of the meetings you just talked about. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. That's yeah. right, yeah. Thank you. Okay, so um, just to thank you, Alina, so much for all your help. And again, Charmaine as well. Um, uh, just to piggyback from what Alina mentioned, um, it feels so, I feel like I've been with uh, this department longer, but it's only been five months. It's, it's just the budget. It's, yeah. <laughs> Um, but I'm still in the, tra you know, transition phase, training phase. Um, my big, huge rock is the um, budget. Um, I feel like I entered the, the budget process kind of towards the middle of it. And now we're closing up the year, which is very interesting to learn on my end because, you know, um, that's my whole thing is to grow and learn um, more about this position. But um, so until the the management analyst um, is um, selected, um, I help with the budget, um, and that is definitely a beast. Um, I'm doing the best I can. Um, again, just closing out the year because uh, June thirtieth is around the corner, and making sure that all our all of our purchase orders are um, paid for and completed, and um, things are allocated and everything like that. Um, and then just helping as much as I can um, and learning at the same time um, on the administrative side. Um, so that's it. Thank you. And thanks, everyone. So thank you, Alina. Thank you, Robin, for your hard work. And that completes our report. Right, excellent. Thanks. I'm um, going to turn it over. I know uh, Executive Assistant Chief McGrath was not able to attend today, but I'm not sure if someone from IA wanted to give the police department update. Hi, everyone. It's Yeah, this is Dan Sias on, from IA. Yeah, I actually don't have any updates on this. Chief McGrath would be the one who would be able to talk uh, on these issues. And unfortunately, he had a prior engagement and couldn't make it. So uh, with that said, we don't have anything from IA. Okay, I can give a, a quick update then. So. Um, mm -hmm. 
A, uh, the first section, we had made recommendations quite a while ago. Uh, there were some verbal responses to that uh, at one of our, our open session meetings. We have asked the police department to formalize that in a written memo. Uh, so the last I heard when I spoke with um, Chief McGrath is that it's in legal uh, on their side uh, to make sure everything's fine and we should be getting that you know, in the next week or so. Um, the one right after that, we had just barely sent those recommendations. I typically give the department about 30 days uh, to respond before I start uh, pestering them for a response. Um, so it's a little bit early on these, but um, he has told me that they're aware of it due to COVID and all that. As, as many people know, there's been a little bit of rash of COVID lately uh, and the police department has, has been impacted by that as well. So he had shared with me that um, some of the officers that are, are gonna be doing some of the research on this were unavailable. So there's a little bit of delay on that. Um, the status meeting, or sorry, the status of, of doing a cabinet meeting uh, with the training cabinet regarding the use of force and show of force reporting. Actually, this morning I had a call uh, with Captain Morris uh, about that, and I'm actually going to include that in the uh, chair uh, update that I'm probably going to be sending out, uh, hopefully tonight or maybe early tomorrow morning. Um, the end, so a little bit of background story for the public who might be watching. In the policy committee meeting, we had a discussion about uh, show of force versus use of force and what's reported. So we did reach out to about 10 different law enforcement agencies throughout California to find out what they do. Um, some departments, basically like Berkeley, for example, if an officer unholsters their weapon, they have to report that. Um, so we were told at the time that there were some changes that were being made here in San Diego. And so we put that on hold on our side uh, to find out what those changes were. Um, and so I did actually get that information. As I said, I got that today and I'll be sharing you uh, with you all the, the public document. It's, um, it's a department um, order, I believe. So it's, it's a little bit different. Those don't usually get shared with us. Uh, they just kind of get posted. And apparently that order was put out almost a year ago. So anyway, I will share that with you guys on that. And then um, I have no updates on their staffing uh, or training. So with that, we'll just put all that on hold until we have uh, Chief McGrath here next month. Um, next up is Commissioner Ride-Along Reports. I'm not sure if anyone has done a ride-along, uh, if anyone has a report they'd like to give. Please feel free. And if not, I know COVID's kind of coming back a little bit, but if people are comfortable doing it, um, I would definitely recommend getting back out there and doing ride-alongs. Um, I personally find it helpful to do at least two a year. Um, I know in the past we've had uh, former board members and commissioners who wanted to do it every month. I, I don't recommend that. We don't want to be kind of, I don't say bothering, but we don't want to be doing so many ride-alongs that you know we're, we're doing every month. But I do think you know, once a quarter, I think it's completely reasonable if, if commissioners want to do that. And just as a reminder, uh, if you want to do something other than ride-alongs, you can do uh, a sit-along uh, with dispatch. Uh, so as they're taking 911 calls or doing radio dispatch out to officers, uh, that's a four-hour shift. Uh, you get two hours with call takers and you get two hours with radio. Um, I did that about four years ago, and I thought it was something that was really fascinating. And, and to be honest, you know, the dispatch, the radio dispatch, she's like, do you understand what we're doing? And it's like, I have no idea because there's like nine computer monitors and they're monitoring like four different frequencies all at the same time. I, I have hands down to them. It's impressive. I don't think I'd be able to do it, but it was a great thing. I think especially for when we're doing uh, complaints, we can kind of understand how that process is. When calls are coming in, we can kind of follow it through the whole thing. Um, and we also do have the opportunity to do uh, ride-alongs with ABLE, which is the police helicopter. Uh, those are two-hour shifts. Those are a little harder to get because you have to book it a lot further out in advance, but we still have the ability for commissioners to do that ride along as well. Um, and I think that's pretty much it on the ride along issues. Are there any uh, commissioner announcements or comments you'd like to make before we end early? All right, well, not seeing any hands raised. We can go ahead and adjourn at 7.13.